that we have a responsibility in this very special moment to address them. So we are going today to discuss three big negative stereotypes about the Greens, and we are going to begin with a very common one that I think you all know, and it's that, you know, the Greens, we, are, we don't understand anything about economics. We are going to ruin the economy. And to discuss that, um, we are going to have Tonia Mastroboni. She's a journalist. She's the Berlin correspondent for La Repubblica. And she is going to interview Philippe Lambert. He's a member of the European Parliament. He's the co-chair of the Green IFA group in the European Parliament. And Grégory Doucet, the Green Mayor of Lyon. So Tonia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Melanie. And to confirm what you were saying a uh, short ago, I mean, Annalena Baerbock, in this moment, which is a Spitzenkandidat of, of the Greens, you know that in Germany, I, I, I speak to you from Berlin, this is a very exciting time because we're going to major elections and the Greens are going well, very well in the polls. But Baerbock is the only one who is, is attacked in these weeks by a very uh, scary uh, fake news campaign. So this is something we should think about because this doesn't hit the other Spitzenkandidat, which are Olaf Scholz and Armin Laschet. So we're going through a very interesting time and we will see what will happen. Um, to introduce our guests, uh, I will tell you that uh, when I interviewed the leading, the ideologies of the new far right in Germany with Götz Kubitschek, he told me already two years ago that his main enemy weren't anymore the social democrats or the socialists, but the greens. That's their anthropological enemy. And this is something also we should think about. And I would start Melanie and uh, for our, our audience, from uh, your, um, your, what you were saying about the economy. And I would start with uh, Philippe Lambert, he's co-chair of the European Greens and the Euro Euro European Parliament. And I would ask you about this costly transition because one of the things they say about the Greens is it, it's a rucola party, it's a party of the rich. And who can afford this transition to green energy really? Uh, can normal people afford it? Well, let, let, let me put it this way. If we cannot afford the green transition and not just the green energy, I mean, if we cannot make our societies fit uh, the planetary boundaries, there will be no humanity to speak of. So we better have to afford it. Do you really think that in 1940, in July, when Winston Churchill was alone facing uh, Nazi-occupied Germany, do you really think that the calculus was, can we afford to continue the war? No. Britain was facing an existential peril with Nazi-occupied Europe. And when you face an existential peril, you do whatever it takes. And I've seen politicians, more traditional ones, when the banking sector is in peril, or big multinationals are in peril, then we will do whatever it takes. But when the basic living conditions on this planet are threatened, and believe me, they are. I mean, life will continue for billions of years on this planet, but maybe not human life. And like it or not, I'm a human. I would like humanity to persist on this planet. Well, then we have to do whatever it takes to save it. Now, when they say the Greens want to kill the economy, what they mean, actually, is they want to take our profits. That is what, what, what is at stake, because at the moment, the planet functions, well, our economies function as if they are the overarching system. And the planet and the living beings on this planet, including humans, must serve the economy. So basically, the subordinates are life and the planet. And of course, the two go together. The only thing that we want to do is to reverse the thing and to say, yes, of course, the economy, we need it to live, but it is subordinate to life. And the, the good news is that the pandemic has brought this reality back forward. We stopped the economy in order to save life. And so we, we, we well, that reminded us that what is primary, what is overarching is preserving life and anything else must serve it. Now, your question is the, the, the more traditional one. You know, the transition is for the rich. It is for the rich if you want it to be for the rich. You cannot at the same time say we need to heavily in invest into the transition. And indeed, let, let me put it this way. 
doing stuff in a clean way environmentally and in a just way in terms of working conditions and all the rest of it, yes, and this is not a scoop, it is more expensive than doing it the dirty way and the unjust way. So yes, because if it was the opposite, we would have seen it. So what they hate is that we want to do stuff in the just way, in the, in the, in the clean way, and that will reduce profits. Yes, it's true. But you cannot do the green transition back to the energy price without rethinking your taxation system, because your taxation system makes the rich richer. If you want everyone to be able to afford a decent life, then you need to distribute income in a very different way. Thank you very much. Um, I would, uh, I would uh, ask, I would like to ask Gregory Doucet, who is the mayor of a city who has uh, has gone through a little rev revolution because uh, Doucet has made um, Lyon the, the the most the, the most ecological city in France. So um, he can speak out of experience, and I would like to ask him uh, also: uh, Was it costly for your citizens in terms of taxpayers, of course, of money of taxpayers? which is something that, for example, Germans insist a lot about, no? Uh, was it costly, your, your transition to a clean city? First of all, I, I would like to say that when we, uh, when we arrived, when we were elected, uh, what we have discovered is that the city suffered from a different kind of debt, actually. Uh, uh, first of all, we, we we discovered that there was a, let's say, a, a huge deficit of investment in public equipments. Uh, meaning to say that we were lacking schools, we were lacking um, uh, sports facilities, we were lacking uh, uh, parks in, in the city, and, and people were, were, expecting, uh, were expecting them. So, um, what would be the cost of uh, not providing uh, public equipments for the benefit of the population? This is, this is actually the real question. Uh, so, of course, investing in, in public facilities as a cost, but what would be the cost of not investing? As, uh, as Philippe said earlier, and I take the opportunity to, uh, to, to say hello to Philippe, by the way, um, what would we are facing a, a kind of existential issue? Actually, we are talking about uh, the, the survival of mankind. Well, but what what the the ecologists uh, what the ecologist policy is about is also to provide well-being for for our inhabitants. So you were talking about we were talking you were talking about about. Uh, life earlier actually uh, as of today we, we 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 haven't decided to increase the tax the tax system in Lyon. Uh, we are doing in i would say in a sober way in a frugal way uh, with what we have uh, but little by little uh, we will we will invest in what our inhabitants uh, are expecting actually mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lamberts, I mean, this is Lambert. Uh, there is one question that we pose ourselves more than, it's not coming from, our en for, for, from the enemies of the Greens, but we have been posing it to ourselves in these times of next generation EU. We know that this is a great, great opportunity for Europe, uh, especially for a country like mine, like Italy, but also for Spain, for Germany, France, Belgium, every country. Uh, but it comes also with um, with some challenges, and one challenge is uh, the challenge to ensure that will, there will be enough jobs for women. This is a, a question that was posed, especially by Alexandra Geze, who is a Europarliamentary that you know very well, Mr. Lambert. Um, so, I mean, we know that digital and green, which will make out of two thirds of the investments of the next generation EU, will be dedicated to sectors which are mainly um, uh, of, of, of male op occupation. So uh, th the jobs are given to men. How can we avoid this? Uh, uh, how can we uh, guarantee gender equality also 
in the expenditure of the of the next generation EU, Lambert? Well, first, uh, I want to keep in mind that uh, the European Recovery Plan Next Gen EU is not the only game in town. I mean, uh, it's actually a tiny pot of money. We're talking here about 750 billion maximum spent over a period of three years. So that is not huge. That is two points of uh, European uh, uh, GDP uh, a year for three years. So there will be many more. Uh, uh, other initiatives next to next gen EU. And yes, it's true that uh, traditionally the sectors that employ mostly uh, uh, women are not the ones that are targeted by the green transition at the moment and uh, by, the, uh, by the digital transition, certainly. Uh, so are these the only areas where we need to reinvest? I would say absolutely not. I do believe that we have to reinvest into the health and education sectors. Uh, which are primarily uh, so far, uh, uh, well, where the presence, the, the, the presence of the women is much bigger. But then again, this is uh, uh, also a matter for member states because these sectors are, are, are mostly in the competencies of, uh, of member states. But I'd like more broadly to question this. We keep thinking as if actually we have to grow the economy in order to create jobs. Is this the real question? No, we want everyone to have a decent and fulfilling life. And indeed, having an appropriate income stream and a stable one uh, is part of the instruments to have a decent life. But then, do we need to create, sorry to say, but artificial jobs or fake jobs just to, to give an excuse uh, uh, to distribute income? I don't believe so. Do we need, for instance, and this is typically the kind of systemic question that we have to ask ourselves, do we really believe that somewhere in the, in the stars it is written in stone that there is useful work, and by that I mean work that contributes for a decent life for everyone, for every human being to the tune of 38 hours a week, 48 weeks a, a year, and I don't know, 40... 48 years of work this is a fiction actually mm -hmm. actually we may not have useful work to that tune and so if actually we need less work that is good news as long as work and income are distributed in a fair way in society so rather than to think in mechanistic terms let's try to add new jobs so that everyone can be uh, busy let us see what job is useful and distribute those, those jobs more equally, more justly in society. Another question which comes with the campaigns that uh, the enemies of the Greens are, are uh, organizing against, uh, of course, uh, clean energy and clean transition, is that uh, this re rhetoric of, uh, and I'm coming to you, um, of course, uh, Mr. To say that uh, the Greens want to cancel cars, that they want to impede us to go by car, and that the mobility revolution is uh, in reality a censorship and something to destroy a very, very important industrial sector in Europe, which is the automotive industry. Um, to say, how was, um, how are you coping with the uh, mobility challenge which comes with the transition and how do you respond to this that greens wants to destroy car the car industry uh, well destroying the car industry is not an objective in itself <laughs> uh, and, and of course uh, as you know the ecologists are often depicted by our detractors as um, uh, people who want uh, bicycle lanes or green spaces. Well, uh, when you when you look at how public spaces are uh, actually divided, you 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 will just see that in a in a I would say ordinary European city, uh, the bigger space is actually dedicated to cars. Yes, of course. So. To, to say it very, very simply, I mean, it's just not fair because you, you and I, we spend most of our life uh, being a pedestrian. So public spaces should be first dedicated to pedestrian before, also, before being also dedicated uh, 
to bicycles or to other ways of uh, of transportation. But but I mean, for me, the the the, the first priority is to give spaces for pedestrians, and then to give the priority to ways to trans for transportation mode that actually are the more virtuous uh, mm -hmm. for 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 all of us for for humanity so cars uh, as far as we can as we can know are are not the most virtuous way of uh, uh, of mobility so i'm not saying that i don't want cars anymore in the city but the space dedicated to cars needs to be reduced. That's it. So we are we are little by little reducing the spaces dedicated to cars by by increasing the size of uh, of sidewalks, the size of bicycle lanes, and of course we we plan or we have started to to invest massively in public transportation mm -hmm. because this is one of the most cost effective way. To actually uh, to go from one point to another with uh, a minimal uh, with minimal consequence on the environment so investing also uh, in a very effective public transportation system is is key if we want to reduce of course uh, the the use of cars in cities mm -hmm. um, Antonia can I add something to that of course because to me it's really typical. It's typical of the bullshit that our adversaries uh, dump on us. I mean, we live in an economy that is utterly unbalanced environmentally, but socially. Look at the concentration of wealth on this planet. Well, what we want to do is not unbalance it to the other extreme. What we want is a healthier balance for human beings. And then they, they, they shape that or they say they want to destroy the economy. They want to, to go to the extremes. Actually, they have put us in a situation where the economy is totally unhealthy. And believe me, you know, I've been part of that economy because that's one thing I want to say. Many of those people who criticize us have never worked for real in the, in, in, in the, in the merchant, in, 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 in the real economy. I'm sorry to say that. They don't know shit about it, but they will tell us, well, I spent 10 to 22 years of my career in the real economy, in a big US multinational, believe me. I've been there, I've seen it. So they should stop bullshitting us because not many of them have done that. Thank you very much. Uh, apropos divide, I mean, there is a European divide, but also a divide between, between Europe, which is avant-garde, of course, in, uh, in, uh, in the fight against, uh, against climate change between Europe and other countries who are more uh, pollu uh, polluting and, and so on. And one argument of the, of, the, uh, of the enemies of the Greens is always, why are we being virtuous if other countries are polluting and so on? Why is Europe virtuous if China is polluting? But the same argument, we can use it in Europe now. We know that there are countries like Germany who are very advanced. We know that there are countries like Poland who are not advanced and to stick, who want to stick to, for example, to carbon energy. No? So how can we cope with this divide? I want to ask this uh, question to both of you because um, uh, Mr. Dusset, you know, of course, that there is also now a fight in Europe. It will be exploding in the next weeks, I think, between the countries like France who wants to put nuclear energy into the goals and uh, are the countries who say, no, this is not clean energy. So what are you saying to these um, arguments? Uh, I would start maybe with Mr. Doucet. Nuclear energy e e is not a clean energy. Uh, Why? Uh, well, because, because it produces waste that we can't manage uh, simply. I mean, uh, how do we manage nuclear waste as of today? Uh, we dig deeply and we hide them and then we leave it to the next generation or maybe the next 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 generation so is it is it uh is it a, an healthy way of treating uh waste such uh, as dangerous as uh, nuclear ones i don't think so so of course as of today facing the immediate uh challenge that we have to face meaning to say climate change uh, we have to decarbonate our our energy production. So, well, 
French people who have who are very let's say proud of their of their nuclear plants are trying to push them as the key solution. But this is actually not a real long-term solution. This is just a way to put uh, uh, the dust under the carpet, actually, just to to push to push a little bit forward uh, further uh, the solution of our environmental issues. So I don't believe in nuclear energy. I'm not saying that we have to close all our plants uh, right tomorrow, of course, uh, because as of today in France in particular, uh, a, a huge part of our electricity is still produced by nuclear uh, plants. But little by little, we have to follow the German example and uh, close down our nuclear plants. The, re the, the real issue is how to re reduce our energy consumption, of course. Uh, we have to produce energy differently. We have to go, we have to uh, invest in renewable energy for sure. But we also have to engage our countries in real and, and effective uh, policy dedicated to reducing reducing our energy consumption this is okay. this is a need this is a necessity as of today and look at what we are look look at what we are doing on an everyday basis we are we are we are polluted we are we are polluted by by this mindset of we are we are actually children we are children we are children always willing to have more to have more of this more of that and to consume again and again, and and we are, is we are acting as if we we can't we can't help consuming more and more energy, and and this is something we have we have to depollute our minds with these habits, and we little by little we have to go for for more sobriety, uh, frugality. For me, this is this is key and. As uh, as mayor, uh, I, I believe a lot in exemplarity. You know, as mayor, uh, I just bike to go to the town hall every day. Uh, I I don't I I just use car maybe uh, one or twice a month when I really need it. But little by little, we have it, we I have engaged uh, my city uh, in a more respectful. Uh, ways of, of uh, let's say, of consuming energy. But so we have, we are little by little reducing our energy consumption, and we have uh, defining very uh, uh, high level of goals to reduce our energy consumption. Uh, this month, uh, yesterday, we we have voted uh, uh, an, a ten million investment uh, to change our uh, uh, vehicles for the next uh, for the next years uh, to have vehicles that consume uh, less uh, energy electrical or uh, we're, um, using gas uh, sorry i don't i don't know exactly the translation in english but using gas instead mm -hmm. of uh, instead instead of uh, diesel so mm -hmm. This is very, and, and also we have invested in a massive uh, plan to, um, uh, to promote uh, the use of bicycle for our own agents. You know, 8,000 people are working currently for, for the city of Lyon. Mm -hmm. So uh, by uh, also uh, encouraging them to use more their bicycle rather than their cars can really make a difference. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Doucet, Mayor of Lyon. We have one minute left, Mr. Lambert, um, for this very difficult question. I know it is difficult, but yeah, but I think difficult if, because you have one minute left. Yeah, thank you. We should not uh, overdo the kind of comparison you made because you know Germany is the country that has set itself the goal of getting out of coal in 2038. 20, 2038. Right? Yes. 20, Talk to me about an advanced country. This is a country that produces luxury cars that are the, well amongst the most fuel guzzling cars. Of course, in the US, they are worse. But so we, we should not portray good Germany against bad Poland. Poland has inherited an energy system, so has Germany. Getting out of it is difficult. And there we need, again, in a spirit of justice, 
allocate public money subsidies to help not companies but to help people who are the most affected by the transition yes a, a, a 50 year old coal miner in poland has little chance to find again a job after the transition and therefore that kind of person must be helped and even a 40 year old so we need to really subsidize and to help the people making the transition. And yes, there will be losers in the transitions. There's one kind of loser I do not want to support. And these are the owners of capital who have enjoyed 40 years of milking the planet to their own benefit. They, they will end up on the losing side of the transition. And that is just right. Thank you very much, Philippe Lambert. Thank you. And I'm giving back the floor to the 33rd European Green Council. Thank you very much. I'm really quite impressed that you were not so bad with time management. I'm really impressed. Thank you. Um, we are now going to go to a completely different topic, um, but the stereotype is as absurd, not to say maybe even more than the first one. And it's this idea that we hear very often, and it drives me crazy even to say it, but I have to say it, it's this idea that the Greens care only too much, so much about some minorities, the trans people, migrants, etc., and that by doing so, which is a crazy thing, um, we would be defending a model that is dividing the society and not caring anymore about the majority of citizens. It was really hard to say, but I managed. Um, and so this conversation would be um, moderated by Roca Yadialo. She's a very well-known French journalist, writer, and filmmaker. And she will interview two persons. Um, Terry Granke, she's a member of the European Parliament. She's also the co-chair of the LGBTI intergroup. And Sandra Bencic, she's a member of the Croatian Parliament from the Mojemo political platform. So Rokaya, I give you the floor right now. Hi, thank you so much for allowing me to uh, tackle with you all the stereotypes <laughs> against uh, the Greens regarding uh, the minority rights. So um, I wanted to first uh, ask a question to both of you, uh, because you are both of you are involved uh, in, in, in minority rights. And I wanted to know, uh, according to your political stance, uh, the protection of the rights of the minorities is central to your commitments. And uh, my question is, did you choose to protect the minorities over the majority that voted for you? First of all, maybe Sandra Benchish, you can answer first. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we are now in the final day of the campaign of the uh, local uh, local election campaign. and. Uh, we have uh, already uh, finalized the elections for the city assembly in Zagreb, where we uh, gained the majority uh, for the first time. And uh, on Sunday, we have um, a second round of elections for the mayor, and we are expected to win. So I can share the experiences right from the campaign with you. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, first of all, the minority issues are essential to our program and uh, they're integrated in um, not only in the specific chapters, but also mainstream through, um, through uh, other chapters like uh, unit economy and education, etc. So, um, uh, the, the minority groups, uh, which are especially recognized by our program as uh, vulnerable, are uh, 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 people with disabilities. Uh, LGBTIQ uh, groups um, and uh, also um, national minorities, ethnic minorities, uh, but also migrants. Um, and I have to say that um, uh, the parts of the program which were most attacked by the right-wing opponents, but also maybe even in some cases by the center, uh, were those parts of the program that we are actually um, not only um, not only that we choose minorities over majority, but that uh, uh, this kind of the policy is not acceptable uh, because the right wing in in Croatia is the real right wing. You know, they they really they do not accept even um, uh, as equal uh, some uh, some minority groups, especially LGBTIQ. So. Um, 
it was um, uh, we were we were actually um, um, under um, a really harsh fake news campaign, uh, and the fake news campaign uh, was based on the on um, uh, uh, these ideological issues and it specifically targeting these parts of the programs uh, which promoted minorities lgbtq but also gender equality and the gender equality right wing is presenting presenting in croatia as gender ideology so everything that we have um uh, defined as uh, specific rights and measures how we will integrate those groups and and uh, support uh, equal access they uh, presented in a really um, transformed and an absurd way and i can give you some examples uh, for example um, uh, one of our measure measures in the program was to integrate gender perspective in urban planning which is you know normal <laughs> let's say uh, it's not uh, something new or very innovative, but what they actually, how they presented it to the public is that we will have special parks for gay people, that we will have special bicycle tracks for gay people, that uh, we will, um, uh, that we will change uh, the colors on the traffic lights like you know uh, <laughs> red uh, yellow and green into rainbow colors and uh, you know, it was really absurd but but they i mean they really built their campaign on that and uh, i think the traffic lights uh, is the notion that was uh, uh, used most in this campaign <laughs> against us and um also they said that we will change the symbols on the traffic lights you know to have uh, like two women crossing the street, uh, etc. So uh, they, they um, but but they presented him, uh, presented this in a such absurd way that I I still believe not many people believe this. But um, the point was that they wanted to that the the way that the right wing and even even uh, 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 members of the uh, EPP uh, are trying to. Um, you know, um, um, present us as a radical left or a radical green is by using these parts of the program. So it, it seems that it's for them really not important, but for them it's the way out, not to discuss the programs, not to discuss the ideas, not to discuss measures, especially not to discuss local policies, which, you know, you have to really be an expert in order to discuss it. So they wanted to change the discussion from the programs and put it on the, this ideological, ideological ground. Um, to answer the second question, of course, uh, we uh, uh, really, when we were presenting the program, we were presenting the measures in a way to see for the majority of people, you know, what are the measures for the majority? And then also uh, to mention what, what are the measures for uh, different minority groups in a way uh, which was, I think, really balanced. And I think that helped to gain really broad uh, broad support. For example, when we uh, were talking about housing policies, then we discussed about housing policies for all. And then we said, but okay, there are certain groups which are particularly vul vulnerable to ghettoization. So we will have the housing policy, which is, um, uh, uh, which goes against against the uh, ghettoization, we will not build, you know, uh, neighborhoods just for particularly for one group or um, particularly just for, uh, for social, um, for those who are in a socially deprived position. So what we did is that we said that the housing is a right to all huh? and that the housing policy is based on the on the uh, uh, um, uh, on the ground on the criteria that everybody has a right to housing, and then we would say if the, the journalists would ask us, then we would say, okay, there are particular groups we, which have to have, you know, um, um, uh, uh, positive action and and uh, more investment in order to reach the housing. But we need to have housing also for middle class families as well. So <clears throat> this is how we try to. Uh, somehow balanced it, and it actually really worked because um, you know, we gained a really huge uh, huge support. And I will stop here. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Uh
Terry, I'm, could you answer uh, could you answer to the, the the same question and maybe more focus more on your commitments uh, because um, the LGBTQ plus rights are one of your priorities, and I I want. I want you to. I want to ask you why we hear so much from you about a specific group of person, um, and do you think that it's uh, because you're less vocal when it comes to the working class? Did you give Did you give up on economic justice because you know people tend to to um, to see, to say that you are most focused on the LGBTQ rights and that. Um, maybe put the focus on them instead of having like the traditional struggles of the left that would be more focused on economic justice. What can you uh, answer to the people who, who, um, who say that to you? Look, let me start by saying that I think if we are analyzing the situation that we are in, what we are experiencing is an authoritarian wave that is attacking progress that we have seen coming from emancipatory movements, especially for minorities, but also for women, other groups in society over the past years. And I think Sandra has very well pointed out this is not only coming from the far right, but this is also sometimes coming from center right, even social democratic forces in certain uh, contexts. And this is a very, very dangerous development that we are seeing because very often minorities are being scapegoated, they are being ridiculed, and not only because people want to attack them, but because they are trying to use this as a sort of distraction, as a sort of derailing mechanism to uh, go away from maybe issues in society such as tackling climate change, but also social questions, as you were rightly saying, because I think the problem of social inequality is something that is very deeply interlinked with the struggle um, for fundamental rights of all people in society. And when I look at this situation, very often we are the ones that are kind of picked out um, and, and, you know, seen as the representatives of societies that are very fragmented, that only consists of like ever smaller minorities and so on and so on. And I answer to that, that obviously we are defending strong, diverse societies where everybody is enjoying the same fundamental rights. And this is actually not a promise that we came up with as Greens, but this is a promise that is coming from our constitutions, it is coming from the treaties of the European Union, and it is basically the promise of the Declaration of, of Human Rights. So it is really at the core of how we want to build democratic societies. And let me just highlight one thing. In the countries where we see that especially authoritarian governments are doing this the most aggressively, it is not only minority groups that they are attacking in the end, but they are attacking basically the whole fundament of democracies. They are attacking rule of law. They are attacking the independence of the judiciary. So we see that these struggles are very often interlinked. And this is why it's so important to fight also for minority rights, but also for strong resistance and democratic societies as a whole. And let me just finish by saying, I think that it's part of this narrative, um, what you were referring to, that because we are fighting for minorities, we are not fighting for social justice anymore. If you tell that to a young trans person who cannot have access to the labor market because they are discriminated against, this just sounds completely ridiculous because obviously the struggle for social equality and the struggle for fundamental rights for everyone are two things, two sides of the same coin. And I think this is what we as Greens stand for. And this is also what I answer to, um, to caricaturing images like this. Um, Sandra. We could expect expect that the Greens would be more focused on uh, climate and biodiversity. Uh, hearing uh, what I've heard from both of you, uh, and especially from you, Sandra, um, there is a, a large focus on anti-racism. Doesn't that make your voters confused about what your stance is about? Because they, you know, the, when you when you think about the Greens, you think about the environment, and and you know, we have ultimately um, you as an elected official being mostly focused on, uh, you know, the rights of uh, some groups of people. What do you answer to people who who, who say that uh, it's a problem to them? Oh, well, okay. So first, we are green left and uh, even, even our coalition of the parties is called the Green Left Coalition. Our club, parliamentarian club, is called Green Left. So it's quite clear that also, um, uh, uh, especially uh, issues of economic justice and social justice are integrated in our program, as well as uh, um, anti-racism uh, issues. Um, and 
Of course, in Croatia, we have also um, a specific dimension where we are also seen as anti-fascists, which, you know, in all countries would be normal, but not, maybe not all, but in Croatia, it's also like, you know, a contradictory thing, but uh, uh, for the, even the center right, even for the center right, but also for the far right, of course. So, um, how we explain it is that um, you know um, we we are putting emphasis uh, on two things. One is green transition and the importance of uh, prevention of climate climate crisis and climate catastrophe, actually. And the second is um, that this transition has to be just, and that we cannot allow that it's paid by those who are underprivileged already. And in this sense, we are, um, our policies um, are uh, communicated in a way that they are addressing majority. For example, when we talk about uh, uh, issue uh, of migration, um, it's a really hard issue in Croatia. We have a lot of uh, uh, violence on the borders from, uh, on behalf of police towards migrants. Migrants are being pushed back towards Bosnia, which is out of the European Union. And it's really hard to talk about it because uh, you know, majority of people would say, oh, come on, we are already you know, underprivileged. Now we only need migrants. We are already economically deprived. But then what, how we also present it is that uh, you know, the whole policy on the level of European Union is unfair and that it's pushing you know, uh, a pressure on Croatia to do the pushbacks uh, to the, and it's even paid, and, it's, and you know, the pushbacks are paid, but, but uh, the, the police is actually being paid you know, to, um, to secure the border. And how they do it, it's actually not under real scrutiny of the European Commission and European Parliament. Um, recently, they've been into several controls, but still pushbacks are going on. So um, we are trying to put it in the in the uh, uh, global context and context of the European Union, present it as a, as a common problem in which we also have to play part. But we also put the emphasis on the social injustice, and we are trying to uh, present this problem as a problem of our people who are also migrating to other countries and to connect it with the roots of economic deprivation and social deprivation that we also have. So um, th uh, this is the way how we are trying to communicate it, always to relate it to the problems which are being felt by the majority also in Croatia and uh, to be able for them to put, be put in, in others, uh, in migrants, for example, shoes. Of course, it's not, it's difficult. And sometimes we are really being uh, uh, accused uh, uh, for even bringing this up, um, but but we are pushing it. We are pushing it forward, and we are uh, always linking with the request towards our government. We are linking the request towards European Commission because we think that it's unjust on the level of the European Union that it's not you know particular Croatian policy, but it's the policy which. Um, uh, which uh, puts the pressure of the migration and uh, on the uh, on the outer borders of the European Union, uh, whereas of course uh, the center countries, in, which are in the center of the European Union, actually do not want to. Sometimes they do not really want to know how the migrations are being stopped. Thank you, uh, Terry Reinsker, um don't you think that your uh, discourse may be perceived as being divisive? Um, some people would ask you why uh, you don't bring people together instead of dividing them in small categories. Don't they all have the same interest regarding the protection of our common good? Well, I would definitely argue, yes, they do. And this is what we are trying to do, to bring people together. But, you know, very often this sort of accusation is coming from people who for years have pushed a narrative where, you know, there was only one kind of norm that stood for the majority. And this norm was, and I'm going to just say it here, a white, straight, middle-aged, middle-class man. And this is not 
the, this is not symbolizing, this is not standing for the full diversity that we see in our societies today. And I think our role as Greens is how we can build societies that acknowledge the diversity we have, that also give voices to all sorts of people, for example, in parliaments, in political movements, uh, while at the same time, obviously, creating equality for everyone. And I think that this is something um, that is a process. It is something that might sometimes not be easy. But what I have felt is that when you actually don't start on a very abstract level, you know, talking about principles, but when you really start from the personal stories of people who are, for example, affected by discrimination or violence, a lot of people who usually experience themselves as being part of, my, of the majority society uh, are ready to see these stories and are ready to sympathize with them and say, look, this is really something that is not fair. I mean, take the example of marriage equality. Who would have thought that 30 years ago, in so many European countries, we would have the right uh, to marry uh, un, uh, 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 for all. And I think that this is really something where we can see that if you tell these stories, if you bring this narrative, if you turn it around, if you don't take over the narrative, I would say divisive narrative from the far right, but create your own narratives, create your own frames, then we can also win this battle. And I mean, this is what we want, be it when we talk about nature or be it when we talk about societies, we want want to live in diverse societies that are based on equality and freedom. And I think that there we actually are a credible voice. And this is also why we get these attacks, because the right is very, very scared of us. A, a question just raised into my mind uh, for you, Terry. Uh, isn't the cisgender straight white man, to you, white man sorry, your ultimate target? Absolutely not. You know, I work with a lot of them and a lot of them are really great and I'm very happy about their con uh, uh, contribution. Um, I think what we want is this not to be the ultimate norm for anything anymore. You know, but to have these diverse stories being told of people that have different experiences, because in this diversity, we all grow. I mean, this is the, the motto of the European Union, united in diversity, how we can build this, not only for Europe, but also in local communities, everywhere we are, how we can make all these people heard, and how we can then together with all these voices and with all these contributions, build a brighter and greener future. Thank you. So I think that the, the, the cisgender uh, straight white men can be reassured <laughs> about their, their fate in the, with, with the Greens. <laughs> uh, Sandra uh, Benchish, uh, you are, um, you, not you personally, but the Greens are uh, subject to much criticism because of uh, their idealistic views on migration. Uh, would it, wouldn't it be wiser to echo the concerns of a large part of the Euro European population regarding migrants that they perceive, that many of the European citizens perceive as a danger? How, how do you address that? Yeah, and this was the question, of course, that we um, discussed quite a lot, how to actually communicate uh, this issue. And we communicated uh, actually through the prisma of um, integration policies. And um, what uh, what we are uh, basically saying is that, uh, okay, that when we have the migration influx that, or we have individuals who get asylum, for example, um, that not only it's our obligation, you know, uh, to, uh, to provide shelter, um, but that this, this is the benefit for our society if, but only if, the integration policies from education, housing, uh, uh, access to the labor market, etc., are uh, set in place. And the problem is that in Croatia they are not. So what we are fighting for is to set integration policies. What we are saying is we have so few migrants now. It is now the time, you know, to set up the system, to pilot it on the, these small groups and to enhance it in order that in, in case you have a, uh, a larger number of people coming in that the uh, actually system is working. What we are also saying, and this is really important argument, uh, we always, we are always discussing this issue also with the labor unions. 
So we agree with the labor unions what will be the position. For example, our position now on the uh, law on foreigners and employment of foreigners, um, we had a common position with the, with the labor, uh, uh, labor unions, uh, syndicates, uh, that the salaries uh, of uh, migrants cannot be, cannot be in any case lower than the worker on the same position, on the same position with the with the with the same um, structure of the job, uh, who is a domestic domestic worker. In this way, we are preventing uh, the the um, uh, salary dumping, uh, which is of course from our perspective of social and economic justice also very important. So what we uh, what um, uh, our position was uh, that. We do not want to. Uh, we do not want uh, a liberalization of the labor market, in a sense of migration, because that means that the domestic workers will be only changed by the foreign workers, who are cheaper. And this is this you know vicious circle going uh, going directly to the bottom. And this is what we were preventing very actively, very actively in the parliament. Uh, uh, and we have managed even to uh, to secure some some small uh, you know uh, parts of the law which would prevent this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, policy. But but after we were uh, after we had this kind of position, then you know we have the legitimacy to say that uh, uh, that it is important that we have good integration policies and that we accept people who do need a shelter because their country is in a war or uh, other type of conflict or they're socially economically deprived. So um, uh, I think this is what gives us uh, legitimacy because we always also fight for the position of the local workers, domestic workers. And uh, we are very clearly communicating that immigration cannot be uh, an excuse for the gradation of the workers' rights or salaries. So I think that's a really important to communicate. So we just have one minute left. I just wanted to ask to any of you who feels okay to, to answer. Uh, there is a strong need of security that is expressed by the citizens. How do you address that? How do you make people in Europe feel safe? Okay, maybe I, uh, I, can, I can answer this. Yeah, uh, because today, today, our government brought the decision to buy 12 new uh, military planes or what it's called, you know, these uh, jets. Uh, and they announced that they will buy it from France. So if anybody from France is here, congratulations. Um, we, were, uh, we were against it. Uh, because, uh, as far, uh, you probably know, that we we are uh, we had an, uh, two earth devastating earthquakes last year uh, in Zagreb. And, I'm, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, we just okay. have like 30 so, seconds. Yeah. Basically, again, our position was the same. Social and economic issues are priorities, not military at this point in time. So we are always saying it's not that we will never need those planes, but now it's not the time because we have economic and social issues which are uh, priority. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry Renke. Thank you, uh, Sandra Benchish. It was a pleasure. And now back to the studio. Thank you very much. Um, I'm French actually, but I don't think that I can take the congratulations because I really didn't play any role in this uh, selling military planes to you. Um, uh, thank you very much. I'm happy also that all the crying white, um, straight, middle-aged, cisgender men can stop crying. And I'm very impressed by um, the ability Rokaya had to actually play the devil because uh, maybe not all of you know but she's also personally the target of all these attacks for different reasons but constantly in France every day so thank you very much for the effort you put in this uh, conversation um, we are now going to go to um, again completely different topic um, the third stereotype we will discuss today and it's this idea that you know if you really want to take power and to rule a country, you also need to be serious about serious things like 
police, army. And that the greens, like, they are good with bees and nature, trees, but taking care of police forces and security policy, not that much. So that's the thing we're going to discuss. It's going to be a discussion um, moderated by Erika Solomon. She's a journalist. She's the Berlin correspondent for the Financial Times. And she's going to interview two persons, Ernest Urtasun. He's a member of the European Parliament. He's also a vice president of the um, Greens IFA group in the European Parliament. And Maria Oisalo, she's um, the chairperson of the Finnish Greens. And she's actually a minister of the Minister of Interior, so I guess that she actually knows how to deal with these issues. Um, Erika, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. And uh, thank you to you, Ms. Minister Ohisalo and Mr. Otasun. I look forward to our conversation. I want to start with uh, security of borders. Um, and I welcome both of you to respond to this one. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not on mute. Yeah. <laughs> so the Greens are sometimes perceived as too soft on border and security policy. On the other hand, we have reports that say that Frontex is implicated in pushbacks of asylum seekers in the Mediterranean, that EU funds to Africa have ended up in the pockets of Libyan militias or Sudanese police forces um, that have units employed with war criminals. My question to you both is, how do the Greens stand by their principles on more humane treatment of asylum seekers, but also show that they have a robust security policy? Maybe Mrs. Uh, Ohosalo, you can start. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to, the, to this discussion. It's great to be here. And uh, as mentioned, uh, I've now been working uh, for two years as a Minister of the Interior of Finland. And also actually through this whole uh, pandemic, uh, the, this ministry post has been actually quite uh, quite an influencing place because we've been talking a lot about border controls, a lot about how the police is also helping the health authorities uh, in, in this crisis. So I'm, I'm grateful that the Greens also had this opportunity to influence this here. But your questions are really good. We know that we have quite a lot of issues and problems that we need to acknowledge in the European Union level when it comes to migration, asylum policies, we are now, after many, many years, still uh, looking at the Commission's proposal on, on the new pact on migration. And uh, there are good steps forward, but there are also difficult issues that we need to still look and, and we need to uh, make sure that it's still uh, as actually Commissioner Johansson, responsible in this area, has also been enforcing is that there has to be also in the future the right to seek asylum for everybody that comes to the EU area, that this package will not be stopping that. Uh, we need fair and just processes for everybody. And uh, of course, we need to do, we need to work already way before we enter or when people enter the European border zones. So there has to be like three, uh, maybe the commission has been talking about three uh, floor, how about a three floored house where we need all these floors and we cannot just externalize our uh, these questions to third countries around the European Union. So um, what Greens can do here actually when it comes to this pact, we, we have been pushing for, for models that, that will take into consideration more human rights based uh, approaches to this package. Um, that we will have at the border zones, for example, more health checks for people and we will take care of these people right away when they enter the European Union zone. Um, well, before this pact will come out one day, hopefully. Uh, we need to work stronger for, for the Frontex. We know that there has been mismanagement, there has been problems on uh, hiring the new human rights um, uh, personnel to Frontex and, and quite a big of accus accusations have been moving around Frontex and, and we've actually been also, I've spoke with my 
Portuguese colleague uh, Eduardo Cabrita, who is now there leading the, the, they have the chairmanship now in the European Union Council. And, and, and that is, of course, one way to influence, uh, to, to speak with your colleagues and, and then to also I've also been speaking with the commissioner about what is happening with Frontex right now, that we need to have more open processes in, in the whole uh, agency that is getting more power, more money all the time, and uh, we need more transparency in everything that they're doing. So I think we have a great place to influence here. Thanks. Um, Mr. Ortesson, do you want to add anything or should I go on to the next question? Well, maybe if I can, I would just say that uh, it's clear that uh, uh, the policies of the European Union uh, in our borders, and particularly in the southern borders, uh, have failed. Uh, so the idea that uh, you don't need uh, uh, channels for legal migration and for asylum seekers, that uh, uh, by just blocking everything at the border, every, all the problem will be solved, uh, which is basically what has been presented in the last years at the huge human cost and uh, at the not respecting international legislation when it comes to protection of refugees. This has failed. You cannot say it's a successful policy for securing our borders. And I think here the Greens are a credible voice, in, in, uh, and particularly in Southern Europe, where, I'm, where, where I am from, uh, because our, proposals, uh, our proposal is twofold. Uh, in one hand, uh, managing well the borders means having legal ways for migrants and asylum seekers to get to Europe, which we don't have. And actually, in the migration pact that needs to be presented, the legal uh, the legal uh, entryways for, for migrants uh, for the moment, it's blank page. We have no proposal at all. We've been waiting for that for months, and for, for the moment, we have nothing. Uh, so this is, of course, something that we need in order to better manage borders. And secondly, I think we are a credible voice in defending that we need a, a system of welcoming migrants and asylum seekers which is, uh, which is uh, shared by all member states. Uh, so this is not only the responsibility of the member states which are directly at the border. And I think here in countries like Italy, like Spain, like Greece, uh, where there is a lot of pressure, uh, I think that the Greens are a credible voice because we have been advocating everywhere in Europe for having a solidarity mechanism to have all member states of the EU dealing with this. Great, thanks. I'm going to now move on to some questions that are directed uh, individually. So I'll start with Minister Ohisalo. As you know, this week marked the one year anniversary of George Floyd's killing in the United States. And across the globe, police brutality, particularly towards minorities, has been in the spotlight with protests spreading across the world. And yet many people still feel that policing is important and that politicians especially need to back their security apparatus. The Greens are sometimes seen as one of the most critical parties towards policing practices. Um, and your critics would say that comes at the cost of morale uh, when it comes to the forces that ensure um, society's security. Where do you stand on these issues? Um, do you believe that police work does need to change in certain ways or, or how do you envision the concept of policing? Very good question. And uh, I've actually also been asking from our international affairs unit at the ministry to look through all kinds of practices that different European countries have when it comes to policing and uh, tackling racism and um, improving uh, equal ways to, to meet people. And um, this discussion has definitely been something that has also been uh, here in Finland. It has, even though Finns actually probably compared to many other countries, Finns trust authorities really much. I can say that, let's say, over 90% of the Finns think that the local police is someone to trust for. And that is something, I think, one of the most valuable things that we have. And I think it, it actually has also helped us to go through this pandemic time that we have been managing the pandemic quite well because people have been listening to what authorities have been saying. And uh, um, obviously what stands in the core of whole green ideology is, is pacifism. But it doesn't mean that we would be dismantling the police or 
uh, we would be demilitarizing uh, uh, different zones or or so on that we do understand that we need these apparatus and uh, instead of maybe having more and more of these let's say um, neighborhood watches without any kind of uh, legal um, ways of uh, working we we don't want to have these kinds of groups and we've actually been facing uh, the rise of these kinds of groups even here in finland uh, people gathering around uh, quite right-wing ideologies coming together going at the at the streets and and trying to take the justice into their own hands and this is something that we definitely don't want to happen we want to have a welfare state where we also have um law enforcement authorities who are educated well educated this is something i guess the trust also comes from there that the police education lasts for over three years and people are really educated for different kinds of situations and meeting different kinds of people from different kinds of situations and so on so this is something that we're going to need in the future and i've been in a good situation at this government because we have been able to uh, actually increase the amount of police men and women um, at the streets uh, and uh, this is something that especially now after the pandemia or we're still in in the pandemia but it's getting hopefully a bit better we see that youngsters are really uh, taking it harshly the the pandemic has affected their lives quite a lot and we see more crimes criminality related to young people especially and we just during this week have been able to also lift the funding of uh, both mental and substance abuse services but also for social services and also police and uh, especially funding for police uh, preventative work because i actually think that social exclusion is the the worst uh, risk the biggest risk for the internal security that we have um, and this has been so not only during my two years but actually the ministry of interior here in finland has been writing these reports on interior on, on internal security for years and has been talking about that that there is a fact that a small amount of people who are the least well off also end up doing more crimes becoming more victims of the crimes and accidents and this is especially where we need to go uh, related to all social and healthcare policies uh, social policies educational policies but also security policies we need to prevent these people to end up in to that kind of worse situations where they can only where the criminal life is is an option so i think here especially as green greens we have quite a lot of ways to influence and also try to we're trying to all the time broaden the idea of security that security does not only mean the amount of uh, police forces or, or army size or, or the, the amount of border guards, but it's also everything that happens way before police comes into the place. Oh, very interesting. Um, thanks very much. Oh, I'm out of the screen. <laughs> anyway, um, Mr. Otisun, my next question is about a foreign policy for you. Um, the Greens are trying to make a case for a more ethical stance in politics in terms of human rights and social justice. Your critics say that this sometimes lacks pragmatism. Some even argue that it could be problematic for one of your more central causes, combating climate change. One example uh, is relations with China. How can Europe's Greens afford to take a tougher stance uh, regarding trade and human rights, but also keep Beijing on board uh, for climate change issues? So I'm curious, how do you implement ethical policy and also maintain important strategic objectives? Well, I have to say that the critics who tell uh, us that we are not um, uh, good enough to deal with the foreign affairs, I can only say, well, firstly, 
we have been in charge of the foreign affairs of major countries like Germany many years ago, and we are also in charge uh, in, in Finland. Uh, a colleague of, my, of Minister Oisalo is uh, Pega Avisto, who is dealing with the foreign affairs. So this is an area we are very much familiar with, also in executive functions. So um, this is something that, uh, that uh, it's uh, important uh, to say. Uh, secondly, uh, I think uh, that when it comes to foreign policy, uh, we are uh, a strong voice uh, in defending multilateralism, but also uh, we want that the European Union combines a more assertive for foreign policy, because we are absolutely for a more assertive uh, foreign policy, so for a Europe who is able to speak with a stronger voice in the world, but on the other hand, we, that, that this does not forget that which kind of role do we want to play, uh, and uh, Europe can be a strong actor in the world if it uh, has its own voice. So it doesn't it doesn't help uh, if we are at the global stage just uh, defending our interests, forgetting about human rights, because that would mean that the, uh, the place of Europe in the world will be uh, defuminated in a sense. And when it comes to China, for instance, I think that um, in the in the, the the investment agreement, I think that the Greens have been a very strong voice in saying that this investment agreement cannot forget what is happening in certain areas of China when it comes to human rights and particularly with the Uyghur population. That doesn't mean that we are uh, not ready to engage with China in climate change, but engaging with China in climate change in a multilateral framework means also speaking face to face to China and telling to China what we think does not work there. It doesn't mean that the economy, uh, economics needs to be first and the first place be, uh, before any other consideration. I don't think this is the way the European Union needs to deal with its, uh, with its foreign policy. So I don't think uh, this approach that we have in foreign policy can be uh, uh, accused of being naive. On the other hand, uh, I think that we are, if you take for in, in, the Europe, in uh, the European Parliament, you can see that the Greens are the ones who are most advocating for a unified foreign policy at EU level to be more assertive. But of course, we will not forget that human rights need to be at the center of the agenda. And, but do you think that there's a way to um, ensure that countries like China would continue to pursue uh, a climate agenda with you? If you, I mean, knowing what we know now about the more hawkish stance that they're taking in diplomacy, do you think that's still a feasible um, path for, for the Greens to navigate? I think it is completely a path to navigate. I don't see at all China disengaging in climate talks and the, and the commitments uh, when it comes to the Treaty of Paris, because Europe is speaking with a stronger voice when it comes to human rights. The engagement of China uh, when it comes to climate change uh, is twofold. Uh, firstly, it's an engagement because China wants to be credible as an actor in the multilateral arena. This is very clear. So it's uh, on its own interest. Secondly, because it also knows, China also knows uh, that uh, they need to win uh, the economic transition towards the low carbon economy. It's in its own interest as well. So th those are two reasons why I think it, uh, China will not disengage of the multilateral framework uh, uh, to fight climate change. So this is not a reason, in my opinion, not to challenge China in human rights. I mean, China will continue to be engaged in climate, uh, in climate change, and we need to speak face to face to China when we believe human, that their human rights record does not match uh, the international standards. Thanks very much. Um, I want to move on to a question about um, economic versus military tools. Um, as um, Minister Ohesalo mentioned, the Green Center pacifism as a core principle, and um, that is sometimes seen as being against military solutions uh, with a preference towards economic tools. Um, your critics say that isn't enough. You need a robust defense policy. Um, how does Europe, for example, take on more responsibility for its own security and um, um, develop European sovereignty vis-a-vis sovereignty -vis Washington or Beijing without spending more on defense? Um, are economic tools enough to accomplish this? Or um, you know, how, how do you uh, navigate this field um, and also stick to um, the beliefs around pacifism? If I may start, I think this is also something, I guess this is a question that also divides the Greens, uh, probably even in my party, when we go to the European Union, uh, the EU parliamentary elections, uh, and we have these election machines where candidates can go and answer questions and put their reasonings there, and then the voters can go through candidates and their ideas, and I know that 
our greens have also been in a bit different stances that some has has said that uh, there shouldn't be more uh, military um, armed uh, cooperation between the countries that that or then there are also candidates who have been saying that uh, especially here in the Finnish perspective we need to do more together with the Nordic countries also together with NATO countries, the whole question of uh, going to NATO, uh, you know, Finland and Sweden, we are still not there. And uh, the question always comes up just before the parliamentary elections. And then and even in the Greens, there are more and more people who think that we should be uniting our forces more. And also when it comes to the European defense policies, some things that we should do more together and some things that we should not. But we also have uh, uh, big, big uh, international powers that, that we need to work together with. And uh, um, unfortunately, we know that not always does the trade just solve everything, even though EU is, for me, I think personally, it's a peace project and uh, it should find more and, and other ways to, to tackle crises around the world also than, than just by militarizing uh, the processes and, and, and making it more into that direction. So, but I don't know if maybe, maybe Ernst, if you can continue, how do you feel? Do you think that we all stand in the same position here as Greens or do you think that we differ in this? ideas also well I, I, I of course the issues of defense have always played a, a strong debate inside the greens it would, it would be foolish to deny that uh, but i also think that uh, we have been uh, at the european level um, more and more maturing towards a position uh, that uh, signals the need uh, for uh, the construction of the of a european defense well, then the construction of the European defense means that we don't want uh, European defense tools to be created as an addition to the already uh, national defense system, which are huge if you take all the 27 together, but more like a process to rationalize and put efforts uh, together uh, in, a, in, in a European, um, in a European uh, arena. I think this is the way how we, how we uh, approach uh, defense policy. So it means uh, uh, rationalizing, unifying, and having a, a, a real European uh, de defense policy. Uh, secondly, I think that, of course, we want uh, to be a credible player uh, uh, in, in peacekeeping. And this is really a, 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 an area where I think that the European Union can, uh, can, uh, has a lot still to do. This is very clear. And thirdly, and this is also important because it belongs to our soul, uh, I think that uh, when it comes to defense, we really want uh, to respect these, uh, the, the international treaties and legislation when it comes to disarmament, uh, disarmament and, and denuclearization. And one of the things we are uh, fighting at the moment is something that Europe does very badly, which is its policy of arms export, uh, exports to areas where uh, there, are, uh, there are ongoing conflicts, which several member states do in clear violation of the common position uh, on arms exports. So this is, a, I think, the balance where the Greens stand. I think we want the European common defense in, a, in order to rationalize, to be more effective, but at the, at the same time, I think that Europe needs to be credible in respecting uh, the international rules when it comes to disarmament. I just wanna, we have about two minutes left and I just wanna throw out one last question related to this issue of, of how you, uh, you know, deal with authoritarian regimes. Um, within the framework of, of how the Greens try to approach foreign policy and defense. Are economic tools enough or are there other things in the toolbox that you think maybe the Greens also advocate that aren't discussed um, as much? I'm thinking about the failure failure to leverage an impact on countries like Syria or Russia. And of course, most topically, it remains unclear whether or not EU actions will be enough to change Lukashenko's course um, right now in Belarus. So I'm just curious if you could say any more about what are the things that the Greens could push for in this area? Maybe Mr. Otosun, you can start. And then Ms. Ohisal, if you want to finish off, we only have a very short time, 30 seconds each. Well, 
if I have to mention one thing, uh, it's a problem of unanimity in the Council when it comes to foreign policy, which is blocking uh, our assertive and strong action in different fields. In Syria, that was the case. Uh, we had uh, different member states playing different roles uh, in Syria. Uh, and also, in order to be more strong with situations like we saw the, the other day with the kidnapping of the plane, we need to get rid of this uh, unanimity rule, which is something I hope that in the upcoming conference of the future of Europe will be able to address. Fantastic. Thanks so much. I think we're almost out of time, but Ms. Ahoysal, if you want to make a last point. It's just in general, I want to thank you for the good talk, and I hope that we can continue from these topics, because I think the Greens have more and more influence when it comes to these uh, internal and and then all these security poli policy issues around the europe around the globe and we need to put our forces together as a as a movement also and um, we can change quite a lot of things together and i think that we should also go for the big places where we can influence these issues too Oh, thank you so much, both of you, <laughs> and um, many thanks. Have a great evening. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for the very high-level discussion. I hope you enjoyed it. There is at least one stereotype we cannot make anymore about the Greens, is that they are late and they don't know how to manage the time, because I have to say we are perfectly on time, so I'm very impressed. Um, I didn't think that was actually going to happen. Um, I also hope that the discussions are going to continue. I think in this political moment where spaces for calm, reasonable, contradictory debates are very rare and they are very precious. Of course, we could have talked about a lot of other things because unfortunately we had a lot of other ideas of bad stereotypes about the Greens. But I think that um, beyond the content of what we discussed, I'm personally very happy that we accepted collectively to do this exercise, to have discussions that we don't necessarily like and to answer questions that are not necessarily pleasant. I think it also shows that behind the green ideological matrix, there is not simple and easy reasonings all the time. There is really this acknowledgement of the complexity of the world, of the fact that we always have to adapt and be self-reflected. And I hope that you enjoyed it and that we are going to continue the discussion in another format very soon. That's the end of the session. I'm going to leave the stage, I think, now, take my papers <laughs> and give the floor to someone else. Thank you very much. All right, all right, all right. I'm back. Thank you very much to Melanie Vogel. Thank you for all the speakers who were here with us today. It was super interesting. I hope you found the answer on the question we asked today. So before announcing the break, um, after the break, there is the long-awaited conversation between Annalena Baerbock and Vula Tsetsi. I think you know what's, what is going to happen. I'm sure you have been looking forward to it. So. Little break and see you in a few minutes. <laughs>